All right, so this lecture is going to do a little bit of um, background and information on the science of, of human cloning, but also looking at animal cloning because, of course, the experimental models for humans are first done in animals, and there's a long history of cloning in animals, um, which leads us to um, think of the ethical questions of what if we apply these same t techniques in humans. Now, one of the common misconceptions of cloning and that you'll find in movies and stuff is that you could clone an adult into another adult. And and the way the technology works, that, that currently is not possible. I don't know if it'll ever be possible. But <clears throat> this is my family picture. If uh, I think I use this as an example of asexual reproduction. Um, but... Uh, in reality, if cloning were real, you wouldn't be, like I said, doing an adult for an adult. Instead, you would your your child that you had that you gave birth to, um, or fathered, would be the exact same gene, have the exact same genes as you. Now there is some uh, changes that are environmental, which occur even to your genome, and we call this epigenetics. So you wouldn't be able to control, for the most part, for the epigenetic differences, but every part of the DNA would be the same. Now we already have human cloning. Uh, it occurs naturally in the form of um, identical twins, and that is where a cell early on in development after it's fertilized splits into two separate cells um, or two separate clusters of cells and then those both develop into a human so there is a process by which cloning naturally occurs uh, identical twins are essentially clones they are genetically identical um, however having a genetic um, genetically identical offspring is not currently how humans reproduce so if I were to clone myself, I would need a surrogate mother to um, implant my DNA with my, my um, uh, zygote, I guess, carrier of my genes. And then what would eventually give birth would be an exact replica of me and my genes. And, and it would look like me and it would probably act like me in many different ways, but I couldn't control for the genetics. So that, that I think, is a, a little more foreign concept to people. Could you imagine having a child that was exactly like you in every way? And, and perhaps we already kind of think this way, um, or at least I do when I've had kids. I thought, oh, well, they're going to act and think and be very at least similar to me, but they aren't. They all of my kids have their, um, you know, there obviously obviously are some similarities, but they are very much distinct individuals. Um. Anyway, so we're gonna talk then a little bit more about cloning, but first, let's go and discuss this timeline. Now, this timeline isn't complete. This is a graphic, um, from. Uh, yeah, I didn't put down the reference, but I, I will give you that reference. Um, but basically what this graphic did is they compiled basically the history of cloning in animals. And this is significant because there are different techniques which are used, and even there are some human things in here as well. Um, and so cloning is not necessarily, there's not necessarily one way to do it. There are lots, lots of different ways. So on the top here we have... Um, in orange, we have humans. In green, we have uh, animals. And then this kind of purplish-red-ish pink is extinct or on the brink. And the size is the buzz around the subject in Google Scholar. So how much, uh, how important was that in our current research and it being uh, cited? So first, the first... Um, manipulation of an animal was actually a tadpole from I assume a frog but it could have been a salamander but yeah 
um, where they replace the nucleus of an egg with the nucleus from a developing embryo. So these are actually pretty close in, develop, in development, um, but taking a haploid egg nucleus, removing it, and then putting in a diploid um, nucleus. And so the, the clone was the embryo and now this new egg, which could develop. The next significant uh, cloning was a fish that was cloned um, with, by a different technique, by inserting the DNA of a male carp into a female carp egg. Um, and then the first mouse was cloned in 1979 by splitting mouse embryos. So this would be similar to how identical twins are made. Uh, but by splitting them and implanting them into wombs of ad adult female mice. So creating identical twins um, by splitting the embryos. Oops. All right. In 1980s, the sheep and cattle were cloned using the same technique as with the tadpole. So taking an embryo, removing the nucleus, and putting it in the nucleus of an egg. The Kind of the big thing when I was growing up was Dolly the Sheep. And Dolly the Sheep uh, appeared on Time magazine. Uh, so this is when I was in high school. Um, so this was the first time where somatic cell nuclear transfer um, was cloned, uh, was used on a mammal. And the thought is, well, if you can do this with mammals, you can do it with humans. And we will talk about this process Um, and then we have, uh, Jean, the cow. So after this, after Dolly, the sheep it became pretty common to name your clone. Um, so with Jean, the cow, this was done by removing a cell from a fetal calf. So not yet born and fusing it with an unfertilized egg with its nucleus removed. So similar to the um, tadpole technique, but something different, slightly different. Um, I'm not sure what that difference is. But this then uh, brought on the idea, well, now we can create a herd of these clones of these perfect cows, perhaps. Uh, all right, here's our first human one in 1998. We learned how to make embryonic stem cells um, from embryos and then culture and grow those um, kind of indefinitely so you can create more and more and more of these embryos, create these stem cell lines. The idea here was to make some stem cell uh, therapy, including replacement um, cells for injured or damaged or diseased um, tissues and organs. All right, 1998, we have um, for cows cloned from fetal cells for the first time. Um, this is uh, possibly creating uh, transgenic cows having human um, milk uh, proteins in them from the milk DNA. Um, also done with Mira the goat. All right, our first kind of extinct or endangered animal uh, cloning technique was done with the Tasmanian tiger in 1999, where they took an extinct animal and put, put some of the genes into a living host. So this is kind of cool. Well, we can bring back the extinct, possibly. All right, we've got a pig, a gaur, a mouflon, some kind of sheep, and Xena the pig were cloned using a new method, microinjection where they're using specific genetic material. So this is a G, this is different than the Dolly method. And makes more specific genes. 2001, human embryos were cloned uh, and they were actually um, were allowed to divide up to the six cell stage. And after that, they were, they were not willing to um, continue that experience. I think there was actually, um, they were programmed to die. They weren't going to be able to develop anyway. 
Um, so they cloned these pre-programmed dying embryonic cells. So kind of a lot of ethical issues surrounding that one. All right, 2002, you have a domestic cat cloned. And so now people start cloning their pets. Okay, um, the calf was cloned um, from a dead cow. So now you can bring back possibly the best meat. Um, so, all right, you can kill all these cows. You can determine which has the highest quality meat, and then you can still take the DNA and clone those with the best meat. All right, uh, we have another endangered animal, the the banting, um, which was also done from an animal that had died 20 years previously. So we're pushing the limit of how far back you can get DNA and clone animals. Um, gray wolves also, in 2007, were able to be cloned using a dead wolf and inserting it into domestic dogs, the Pyrenean ibex, similar. In 2007, the first primate was cloned. And this is significant because now we're getting closer and closer to humans. Uh, so this is uh, a process similar to Dolly the sheep, replacing the nucleus with an egg of an adult, uh, with, with the nucleus, sorry, replacing the nucleus of an egg with the nucleus of an adult cell. So again, this is creating then a baby with the same genes as an adult. 2011, um, we reprogrammed stem cells from an endangered animal, the white rhino. In 2011, we actually made the cow that could make human milk for the most part, using uh, genes from humans, inserting them into this cow. And then uh, in 2010, they cloned a bull that was had a specific perfect purpose. So it was an elite fighting bull, which they usually kill at the end of the bull fight. So you could clone that bull and raise it and reuse it. All right, in 2011, human stem cells were cloned from adult skin, since skin cells. This is induced pluripotent stem cells. We'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about this project as well, bringing back the woolly mammoth, an extinct um, elephant-like animal. And there are a few projects working on that. All right, so there's a lot to cloning. It's pretty interesting, um, and it's been around for a while. There's lots of different techniques. We'll go over one next called somatic cell nuclear transfer. So the first thing, though, we want to talk about is in vitro fertilization, because that's important to this, and we may have covered this already. But in in vitro fertilization, you have a sperm donor, and you have an egg donor, And each of these have a nucleus, a haploid nucleus, meaning it just has one copy of the cells. And what you can do is you can mix that in a fer in in a in conditions we know which are appropriate for fertilization, and create then. And this is all occurring outside of the human body. Um, and you create a zygote. Okay, and so that now has a new nucleus, which is half from the egg and half from the sperm. And that's what we all are. We all have this. All right, from there, the zygote then um, starts to split through a process called cleavage, and it splits more and more, goes through multiple rounds, right? And so now, and the small, and the cells don't grow, so it's getting, the cells are getting smaller and smaller while they're becoming more and more numerous. And then at some point, you can take this developed um, zygote, which has gone through many rounds of cleavage and mitosis, and implant into a, a female donor. 
a female surrogate mother. Well, or may it be actually, it may actually be her egg to begin with, right? So that's how in vitro fertilization works, right? So implantation then occurs. All right, so somatic cell nuclear transfer. What you do here, and this was first done with Dolly the sheep, where they took a mammary gland cell. So this is an adult cell. Somatic means then adult non-reproductive cell. So it's not from the testes, it's not from the ovaries. All right, so here I am, or here's a person. You take one of these cells, all right, and we're going to zoom in here. Now here's the cell. It has its own nucleus. All right, and what you can do is at this stage, at the zygote stage, you can remove this nucleus. So this is called enucleation. And you can then insert this nucleus into there. So this is the somatic cell nuclear transfer. You're transferring nucleus into a, a, a zygote, something that is ready to go through cellular division. So now that you have this new nucleus in there, all of these cells... Okay, we'll have the new nucleus as it continues to divide, and then you implant it into the uterus of a surrogate mother. And what comes out is, uh, you know, after being born, you have a baby, which is genetically identical to the somatic cell donor. It's a baby, it's not, right? It's not going to be the same as an adult, but it's going to be exactly the same. So that's, that's how reproductive clone, cloning using somatic cell nuclear transfer would work in humans. It hasn't been done in humans. The question is, should it, right? That's, should we do this? And hopefully that's a question that you can um, think about and we can discuss on the discussion board. All right, so I wanted to talk about one other project, and that is the bringing back the extinct, let me see if I can get this to come up, the extinct woolly mammoth. All right, so this isn't human cloning, but it, it, it's, it has a lot of ethical, ethical questions, which I think are important to understand because it has to do with us as humans. Um, now, woolly mammoths, um, I've never seen one. Uh, no one alive has ever seen one. They aren't something that has really been important to uh, Earth life for tens of thousands of years. But it is thought that their extinction was probably due to humans hunting them, you know, in addition to other climate changes as well. Uh, but this website, Revive and Restore, it details the efforts of um, scientific uh, efforts to um, clone and or reintroduce the woolly mammoth. So the, the progress to date is that they, uh, they need to um, identify genes which are important for woolly mammoth features and woolly mammoth uh, survival. So the first one is blood oxygen release at low temperatures. So they need to find those genes. Um, they need to find genes that will produce thick hair and they will need to um, provide genes that will give them a thicker layer of fat so that they can insulate against the cold. So these are adaptations for the colder environment. Now, one of the questions, I mentioned this to my son the other day, one of the questions he asked, well, where would you put them? 
And well, you would put them in a cold environment, uh, such as in Siberia or Alaska, um, where there are actually large mammals, such as muskox, um, which probably inhabit a similar niche to what a woolly mammoth would. Um, but they aren't as big, and they definitely aren't elephants. All right, so the next step after identifying those cells are to grow um, stem cells of the different things that you need, the blood cells, hair, hair, hair cells, and fat cells. So then you can analyze them and uh, determine how well <clears throat> they are doing for the specific genes that you want. Um, and you can also uh, you know, see if the process in the genes uh, worked. Now the future steps are, um, yeah, it doesn't have any nice pictures of those, but they're still working on the genome. Uh, they would uh, eventually, uh, once they could create then embryos that have these desired features, insert them into an Asian elephant um, and have them be the surrogate mother, and then you would somehow raise them into um in captivity and try and simulate a, a natural environment and then release them into the wild now my question for this is why why are we doing this um so there's there are uh you can peruse this website and try and they have an about this project page Right, um, and they talk a little bit more about the goals and the projects and why. But that might be an interesting thing we could discuss. What are we doing? So Pleistocene Park, Siberia, Russia. There would be a, a place where you could put them. It looks like, and we call this. This is um, part of a rewilding project. Um, kind of bringing back some of the species that we have made go extinct. All right, hopefully that gives you some things to think about and uh, some of the science which has to do with uh, cloning. Um, and I will look forward to seeing what you guys have to say on the discussion board and some of the interesting things that you've found. All right, these are just the screenshots from the same thing.